It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat, Mary Joe Foley, and a great show planned for you. We're going to talk about the latest Windows phone news, the latest news about a perhaps 8-inch Surface tablet coming out soon, and why Intel uh, and uh, ARM might be in competition. It's all up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley, episode 361, recorded May 7th, 2014. Shampoo, conditioner, and towel dry. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter for free. A four-day trial awaits at ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. And by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile from Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com, click the microphone, and enter Windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers Microsoft and Windows and Xbox and uh, Hadoop and all... <laughs> you can't Everybody say, drink. You can't say Hadoop normally. You have to say Hadoop. No, you can't. Uh, that's Mary Jo Foley, Hadoop expert and enterprise expert. <laughs> she writes about Microsoft from all angles at allaboutmicrosoft.com, her ZDNet blog. I don't think it's fair to call it a blog. Column? I've wrestled with uh, that. Blog? Yeah, I know. Blog is in some I'm ways okay it seems with demeaning. But yeah, in some yeah. ways that's just the world today, isn't it? Yeah, we don't know what we are. I don't like being a podcast. I don't think we are a podcast, but nevertheless, that's what people understand it as, so. Well, yeah, I just read in a very uh, mainstream news journal that podcasting is not just normal now; it's big business. <laughs> I'd like to know who so, who is, yeah, who, is just, who exactly <laughs> they're talking about, but okay, it was, it was good to hear. Yeah, I'm it's big business. I, hmm. It's those kids out there raking in the bucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, in any event, uh, for whatever it is that you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Therott does it at uh, his site, the super site for Windows, winsupersite.com. Yes. Uh, and we join uh, together every Wednesday to see what's happened in the world of Microsoft. Actually, a big day's coming up, May 20th. Yep. What happens May 20th? Finally, the Surface Mini will be unveiled. Now, this is a rumor or this is fact? Uh, well, we know the date is a fact. We <laughs> know it's a, a surface an announcement. And it is a surface announcement. In New York City. Yeah. Uh, we know all of that. But it, we're all pretty sure, based on our sources, that it's the ARM-based Surface Mini that's being unveiled. And not just been, ARM, Qualcomm I think this ARM. this has been confirmed enough in, you know... It's believable. It's sources. credible at this yeah. point. It, it is. It's the Surface Mini that was going to ship last year. So, you know, I, at some point, I know, I think on the show, we had sort of speculated maybe... Part of the reason they had held off is they were going to change it to an atom type of thing or switch around the design in some way. It, the, my understanding is that what's coming out is exactly the machine they would have shipped last October. Oh. Even even Qualcomm was going to be part of that? Yeah, Qualcomm was it. Yeah. yeah. It was Qualcomm. It was always Qualcomm, yeah. So that was, was the always, weird part. It was always Qualcomm. <laughs> so, yep. so I guess a little, I know most of the audience knows this, but ARM is a design, not a foundry. They don't actually make anything. Uh, they are uh, these low powered. That's like most of Silicon chips. Valley, really. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I don't make anything. Yeah. Uh, and so, but people buy the designs and then make ARM based chips. So Samsung makes ARM based yes. chips. T you know, everybody Nvidia, does. You know, Tegra. Yeah, Tegra. This is kind of the big one. But Qualcomm is probably the biggest. Their Snapdragon is probably used in more phones than any other, mm -hmm. for sure. Yep. What has Microsoft been using now, up to now? Tegra's? Yeah. Tegra. Okay. Although the first gen Surface RT might have been, was that Qualcomm? I think it was Tegra. It was Tegra. Okay. So is there? Yeah, I mean, sure. is there any real difference? I mean, it's all the same design, right? I'm not sure what to what to to say about that. Is that it's not like Intel versus AMD, really, or is it? 
It's sort of like that. I, I guess it is. What they make, what the foundries will make is they'll take the ARM designs, but then they'll make a system on a chip that includes right. other stuff, sometimes right. a GPU, memory uh, controller, um, and so forth. And so the, the system on a chip, I guess there's a significant difference between different mm -hmm. SOCs. Um, and also, I'm sure there are um, geeks who know right. yeah. this. Qualcomm, Qualcomm's what's in Windows Phone, so then you're going to have the same chip oh, that's in good. the phone. But the instruction the set's tablet. the same. It's not like your instructions are right. different, but you could expect you have certain expectations about support yeah. chips yeah. and so forth. And maybe that's, you know, that, this I don't know, and I don't think we know, but maybe the ability to run Windows Phone apps somewhere down the line, uh, that makes it more of a consistent experience, right. you know, perhaps. I don't know. Well, I also think Qualcomm's kind of knocking it out of the park. I mean, they, they seem to have the chips everybody wants to use these days. Um, Samsung still uses their Exynos chips in their European stuff, but even in the U.S., because the Qualcomm, I know one of the reasons that they're, they're in phones, the Qualcomm mm -hmm. system on the chip includes the radios you need. Right. Uh, for But that Microsoft might not care. Or, or would they care? This, Maybe because um, it's an LTE uh, surface? I don't know about that, but I mean, one of the big deals with this device is going to be the you know the stylus and then the ability to write on the screen, which is something you don't see on RT-based devices today. You really, they're not. I, you can't write. Well, no, it's not that you can't. It's just that we don't see it. In other words, the electromagnetic sensor that you would need for that kind of uh, high pro performance stylus is something that we see on um, you know like pro devices, right. like x86 devices. Mm -hmm. Um, and 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 we I think we we touched on this briefly last week. I, you know, Mary Jo was asking I think whether it was even possible to do this on an RT device. And I'm not I don't know, but I I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be possible, right? I mean, other than from maybe a performance standpoint. Right. I mean, but when when the first generation Surface RT and and the Surface Two came out, I believe a lot of people were expecting they were going to be able to use a yeah. real digital stylus, but they couldn't. They right. had to use a capacitive stylus, right? Right, which is basically uh, so, like just using your finger. You know yeah, right. You could use a sausage. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we actually, <laughs> people did. We actually demonstrated that. I think Peter uh, White moist. uses a sausage. Yeah, on you can surface. use a sausage. <laughs> it's a nice snack food. You can use a uh, cheese stick. Works. I've tried yeah. a, a variety of. As long as it's moist. I'm sorry. I shouldn't do that while you're drinking. <laughs> and edible. <laughs> um. But I do think I feel like Qualcomm is kind of racing ahead. Their 60 okay. is it the 801 uh, chip that they announced at CES, and then they got an 805 coming out, or is it 605? I can't remember. But uh, they seem to be, you know, they have more cores. Um, the Surface RT uh, original was an NVIDIA Tegra 3, which was quad core at 1.3 gigahertz. Okay, and then the Surface one was 2 was Tegra 4. Okay, uh, thanks to the chat room. Casual adventure and friendly Manitoba. <laughs> it's like a travel log. <laughs> the uh, Surface RT was kind of a casual adventure. <laughs> I like the Nokia. What is it? The 80, 8525 or whatever. 2520. 2520. Again, with the numbers. You and me, Paul. Yeah. Uh, so the Oldsmobile 2520 is a fantastic <laughs> car. <laughs> I, I still think that was pretty cute. I like that one. Yeah. And I think yeah. that was a Qualcomm. Uh, all right, so yeah, I think you're right. I so think you're right about that. we shall see this on May. We think on May twentieth, eight inches is the new seven inches, right? I mean, it's <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's what everybody wants these days. It's just a little bit bigger, but you could still kind of hold it if you have big hands. I, I honestly, I think the smartphone and the tablet markets have kind of evolved when it comes to screen size. Yeah, and we've you know it, it could continue changing, but I know f personally for me. Uh, five inches on a phone seems ideal. Like a um, the S the Galaxy S5 is a 5.1 inch screen, or the Icon is a five inch screen. It's a great size. You move up to six inches, like you see on a um, uh, 1520 or five point whatever, like you see on those Note tablets, uh, Note phablets. You know that's a phablet. And on the tablet, you know the mini tablet size, they all started out at seven inches. But if you use an eight inch screen, like you see on the iPad Mini, as a typical example. Um, it's it yeah it's just there's something just right about it and yeah, it I makes agree. the seven inch screens just a little too. But you don't want to go too big. Yeah. So the trick no. is what is the sweet spot and it does seem like right eight and I is think those popular. are the sweet spots yeah. you know for those t those products. Yeah. Uh, Ten inches you know nine nine point whatever inches is obviously the sweet spot for, you know like a full size tablet. Um, but it's it's interesting how that's evolved and, mm -hmm. I agree. The, and and the Surface Mini will have that. 
you know, eight inch screen. I wish it was four by three, but we don't yeah. see that. That's so that's going to be really interesting, right? The other piece that we believe is true about the Surface Mini is OneNote is very deeply integrated into this. So it's going to be a it's going to be probably marketed as a note taking tablet. Oh, interesting. So that, yep. but my question is, so did they do anything to make it more usable in portrait mode if they're marketing it that way? Um, or will they have to be. do something? OneNote? Yeah. Or, or just the tablet itself or, the tablet um, itself, yeah. cause yeah, cause right now, um, Microsoft's tablets are designed to be used in landscape, right? Not really in portrait. Well, the, the you mini can, the, but. The mini tablets do default to portrait. I mean, it's not. Yeah. You know, eight point one is a little bit, but I know it's not fantastic. Yeah. But it's, yeah, you know, all of the eight one all of the eight one built in apps are supposed to support portrait natively. And so, if you flip right. the screen around and look at any of them, like the news app, whatever, you know, they look reasonable in portrait mode. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to say they look fantastic. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> you know, they look reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was saying to Paul, I, I'm going to be an interesting. Um, user for this because I am still someone who takes all my notes on paper and it'll be interesting to see if this actually gets me to use a pen on a tablet. They, do have a, they should put a little spiral um, thing. In they the do. I was going to say they have a, oh, on, yeah. the, on the device itself. <laughs> the so device. They, 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 they have a one note template that looks like line paper. Yeah. So for that, it maybe will, that helps yeah. you make the transition. Mary feel right I can put the show notes in that. If you want to. <laughs> yeah, let's do that from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so but, can, but we don't think we're going to actually, that. we don't think we're going to get the devices on May 20th. We think they're probably not going to launch until the latter half of June, based on some tips Paul had. Uh, so we're not, we probably aren't going to walk out of that event with, with Well, I, I mean, I'm not sure that means we're not going to get them if we, at really? the event. You, I mean, I you just, think we'll get I, them that I early? Just, I don't. I have. I have no idea. I'm just. It may saying, not be you for know, sale, but you might be able to. Get, you, the journalists might. Get yeah, it. I'm not. It, it, it's. That would be good. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything yeah. about that, but yeah. Uh, so that we don't we don't know anything about the pricing. We could guess where they might try to come in on pricing. It's probably right. going to try to come in above their OEMs, right? Based on what they've done with surfaces before, and they could justify that if the pen is as good as I'm hearing it mm -hmm. might be, right? Um, but then you're going to have to pay for the pen, or no? Oh come I on! It's got to come it with, a pen. with a pen, but I'm not. A, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Pen not included. <laughs> well, the keyboards awesome aren't pen, right. <laughs> come yeah, on, you got to got to include the pen. It's just a piece yeah, of plastic. I, hope so. I would hope so. I think that's the point of the device. Yeah. It's uh, hearing no key, no kickstand, right? Like the there's going to be a cover that becomes like the there's kickstand. a case or cover that has the kickstand built in. It's yeah, kind of right. the Apple the Apple way kind of floppy yeah, thing. Well, you know, and again, I think this comes down to the portrait orientation. I mean, to, to date, Microsoft has been able to have this common set of peripherals that works off of that click-in connector. Um, I'm sure this will have one, or I suppose it will have one, but it, obviously because of its portrait orientation, um, it may not make sense to use the same keyboard covers. You know, obviously they wouldn't hold on to it the same way and so forth. And um, but maybe the portrait orientation uh, makes it difficult to have a standard kick, you know, like a non-movable kickstand because you would want the kickstand to watch a movie on it and you would want to do that in landscape mode. Right. So they need a new design. And um, perhaps uh, the one that's built in the case will swivel in some way or whatever, but I don't I don't know anything about that. And it, will it be touch sensitive? I mean, uh, pressure sensitive? Will, it, will you be able to have different levels of pressure, that kind of thing? Or, I mean, it's really so, for taking notes, not for drawing. Yeah. I haven't heard that explicitly, but I, I, the way it's been described to me, I don't see how it couldn't, right? Because that's the point of these electromagnetic pens, that they support right. pressure sensitivity. And even even when you're taking notes, if you want to emphasize something and kind of you know, push down on the screen and kind of make it bold, um, I, I think having that pressure sensitivity makes sense. Um, it makes the, uh, without pressure sensitivity, the line is just the line. But if you have yeah. thickness, and it, I don't know, it just feels more like a pen. You can, you can draw on it as well as you could if you right. were an artist on paper. You know, it, it's, it, it's amazing what pressure sensitivity brings to the and table. And this is where the pen is mightier than the sausage. This is where <laughs> the cheese stick hits the well, It depends on the kind of sausage, Leo, but... <laughs> Yes. Right. Tofu sausage. I don't know that no. one. <laughs> no. Sausage. No. That's right. Mary Jo's oh. a vegetarian. She can't Both eat sausage. Your, you can't eat your stylus. <laughs> 
So it, it, it's it's a new angle on like chewing on the end of your pencil. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, any changes for this uh, in uh, Windows 8 RT? Uh, not that I've heard of. I mean, um, that, right? the, the, the confusing bit here is that OneNote integration this is something that I think different people have heard. And it's not clear what that means. And it's not clear if it's special to the device. It's not clear if it's a, you know, a button on the pen or something or, a, you know, something that makes you go quickly into OneNote or, you know, we don't know. But um, I think that's going to be the special bit. I don't I don't see any I don't know. I mean, I, but I don't really foresee any need for other changes to the OS at this point. Yeah. Um, what else? So there's other things we don't know. We don't know about distribution at all. We don't right. because in the past when they've launched surfaces, it's been US and or Canada and the rest of the rest of the world. Eh, sometimes, sometimes not. So we don't know if that's going to change with this. Um, the guess is the reason they're coming out with it now is for back to school um, and yeah. also for grads, dads, all that kind of stuff. Um, so June would be the right time frame for that. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah. we should talk about the Intel. The other mystery part right, of this announcement right, right, is right, right, right. there may be at least one Intel-based Surface at this launch as well. And, you know, there's a lot of speculation if this means it's going to be a mini also based on Atom uh, because the theme of this launch is a small gathering. So everybody's saying, ah, oh, maybe it's going to be another small one. Right? So this would but, be Windows Pro. Right. Yep. It would be some kind of a pro or like mini pro or something like that, that, that um, would be able to run desktop apps, unlike the, the RT based uh, right. one, mm -hmm. or, or is it going to be a bigger model? You know, that's, Paul wrote a really interesting editorial today saying, wow, wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a surface that had a 13 inch screen that was Intel based? That'd be pretty cool. A bigger, a big yeah. one. Like a laptop. It like, would be, right. Like a laptop without a keyboard. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think at that size, they kind of have to include the keyboard. Um, and I actually don't see them ever doing that. So I mean, it's just a laptop. I do. It's not a cert. Well, it's. Well, there's no reason you couldn't have a Surface Ultrabook kind of two-in-one that flips around and becomes a big tablet or whatever. But, I, uh, you know, just the kind of modus operandi over in Surface, I mean, they really seem to be shooting for the future of computing, and Ultrabooks are kind of the past of computing. And, I, you know, as much as I would like to see that, I, I don't think it's plausible. So, you know, what would be the next, if it is a bigger Surface, you know, what might that be? And you'd have to speculate, but, I, you know, Ten, I, the one thing I've said to Microsoft, and I, I'm sure I've said on the show, is, you know, 10.6 inches is not a pro device. 10.6 um, inches is what kids use. It's what, you know, it's what schools have. It's what um, iPad look, is. Yeah, I mean, when you look at Ultrabooks, um, there are only a few 11-inch Ultrabooks, but yeah. they're always aimed at children. Isn't that funny? And, you know, An 11-inch laptop seems like the Mac. I have, ludicrous. Seems too small. It is. Right. It's, yeah. like, it's a, like a dinky, like for kids. Yep, it's That's silly. Funny. And yeah. on uh, the other you hand, know, it's and a professional laptop is 13 inches or bigger. So right. yeah. I, I don't see them going that big. I mean, I wish they would, and that was what I wrote. But I, I'd have to imagine maybe it's going to be something in between those two sizes. Does it have to do with not pissing off the channel, too? Like not wanting to tread on... That's a little late for that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's pretty much, they didn't just open the barn door. They like, burned down the barn, <laughs> you know? And I... I uh, I mean, uh, but remember when they launched the Surface, they they claimed the target was Apple, right? They said we're addressing the part of the market that Apple's addressing, um, and that our OEMs are not. And we feel like our OEMs are doing a great job in the other parts of the market, but we we feel a yeah. need to take them on there. Well, I mean, there were rumors about a twelve or whatever twelve point five inch iPad, right? Like an iPad Pro. Right. Um, you know, maybe. It could be that kind of thing. I, all I can say is, you know, I, I, I just reviewed a, a Lenovo Yoga 2, Yoga 2 Pro, which is a 13-inch Ultrabook that the screen flips around and does all that kind of stuff. And you can sit on that thing and, and flip the screen back and use it as kind of a big and heavy laptop. And because of two things, well, three things really, you know, the 16, point, uh, 16 by 9 aspect ratio of the screen makes portrait mode ludicrous. It looks like it's, you know, 12 inches tall and three inches wide. <laughs> Um, it's big and it's heavy. And so it's it's really not ideally suited for that kind of use. You can do it. And I did it. And I, it was silly. I felt like a like a little kid using big adult, you know, machinery. I mean, it just was so ludicrously outsized. Um, and I think that's, 
the problem that Microsoft faces because I, I, I think they too would agree that 10.6 inches is silly for a pro device. But when you make it a tablet bigger than that, it just seems it, it's it's just untenable. So I'm not sure what they're going to do. You guys will be at this lovely event, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. We will. And where is it? I mean, I know it's in New York, but where in New York? It's, uh, is it at Rattle down and Hum? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, funny you should mention that, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> the, day, the day Microsoft has an event at Rattle and Hum, that's the day I know this show made has it, yeah. made it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there, where, how down, would you describe down, this area? Uh, time? Yeah, it's down in the, in the kind of the meatpacking district around down that way. They did that uh, before, right? Remember, I remember they yeah. had a uh, meatpacking event. Was it Windows 8.1? Uh, yeah, or Windows 8, right? No, 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 for, eight. for us non New Yorkers, the, the, the sobriquet meatpacking district doesn't sound <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, hey, right. too, so it's, uh, sounds like there's it's south, big hooks south with and west on Miami or Miami on uh, Manhattan but it but it sounds like there's big you know sides of beef hanging on hooks that's you know that's what loggers. used to be there <laughs> so, <laughs> that so, is what used to be but not anymore uh very few places still do that now it's there. trendy now, nightclubs well, yeah, if, you, if you Plex, it's New York City live uh, this will blow people's minds by the way um this is an area of Manhattan where the streets still have cobblestones. Wow. Yeah. And wow. It, it's, it, it blows your mind when you see this because it, it is like stepping onto the set of like a Scorsese movie That's or something. Neat. Like it's cobblestones. It makes cobblestones. It just shows you they should be paving all the streets with cobblestones. They last. Rolling a rolling bag on the cobblestones is one of life's most miserable experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's why Microsoft has these events there. Exactly. They really know how <laughs> to make this, so you bloggers. We're going to rattle and hum your brains. We'll probably do a little meetup at yeah. Rattle, right? Oh, good. Afterwards? Either the uh, maybe the day before um, or afterwards. We're well, not sure. probably it would have to be that day based on my schedule. So it's a, tu it's a Tuesday, right? Um, Tuesday. Tuesday's drinking yeah. day for uh, Paul and Mary Joe. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, don't laugh because that means I'll be coming on the on the train right before this show. So oh. I'll be in, I'll be in rare. <laughs> oh, the next day. his hair will be all flying. Yeah, but I am uh, staying over Tuesday night, so okay. I think. Something at Rattle. So I mean, you, so you could I will be sleeping at Rattle and Hum that night. So, do they have a little <laughs> a little cot in the back? Yeah, they have ball. something to break down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, take a horse-drawn carriage over there. Might be like your last chance. <laughs> uh, how yeah, about it? The other the other rumor we should mention is yes. there's a rumor, a pretty good rumor that's very believable that Satya Nadella is the one who's going to be oh. keynoting this event. He's, he, I, think he wants, I think he likes to take the helm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Panos Panay will be there too. He's the head of Surface, but um, it's it's very interesting that, that Nadella is probably well, going to be there wouldn't, too. Wouldn't Balmer do it uh, in, in his day? No? You know, uh, it, they kind of dole out where the CEO goes. He uh, doesn't go to everything. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I think this is uh, you should. I think you should. Steve Jobs would never have, you know, yeah. let somebody else announce a hot new product. It says that this is a product <laughs> we're behind. If your exactly. if your CEO's not there, it's like, well, we're throwing something out. Well, I, well you know, when they launched Surface, uh, Steve Ballmer did yeah. do that, right? He yeah. he was introduced the show and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but he didn't do the Surface Two launch. No, I was just thinking about that. I, yeah, he did not. Was he still there then, or was that already? Yeah, he was. He was. He was. Yep. 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 Well, I, I'm glad. I think Nadella should. I think that's part of the new, the new, kinder, gentler Microsoft. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's not a Microsoft store, a true store here, so they could have done something connected with. <laughs> this that. would be a it's great time to launch a store. <laughs> It would. I uh, I almost sent Mary Jo a story this morning. I read that they were opening a new Apple store, uh, I think near the World Trade Center site. And before I sort of even processed what it was, I immediately started writing an email to her, excitedly explaining her that a store is finally coming to Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong time. And then I realized it is uh, actually the 117th Apple store yeah. on the island, yeah. but not the first Microsoft yeah. store. So. Yeah. The tree grows in Brooklyn. <laughs> a Microsoft store grows in the meatpacking district. It's a classic, <laughs> a story of. I was so happy for her, and then I realized Aww. it's not. Nope. Aww. Nope. Aww. Yep. Not oh, well. yet. Oh well. Someday. 
Someday my store will come. How about a how about a smartwatch? A wearable. Microsoft's not new to this uh Arena, no, at the spot I, I, in fact, in researching the original, uh, you know, the spot platform, and then those uh, MSN Direct. Remember, was the network, yeah. And I think the watches were just marketed as smart watches. I think that was kind of the brand or whatever. But uh, <laughs> it's a great photo I found of uh, that actress. Uh, is her name Misha Barron or something? Or Wait, was Sasha was Baron apparently... Cohen? You mean uh... no, no, no. It was no. A, a skinny, skinny girl, whoever she is. Anyway, she was apparently kind of a big star back in 2004 when they launched these things. <laughs> she's like I've never heard of her. She yeah. is nowhere. In, she's nowhere now. <laughs> she is, mm. but, um, yeah, you know, Microsoft. Uh, I, I, I actually, I don't remember if this was in your interview with Steve Ballmer, but I, he somewhere said, you know, back in the, ten years ago. When Microsoft was riding on top of the world, they had the money to throw around to do all these other kind of essentially public research projects where they could throw stuff out in the market and just see how they went. And uh, that now that role has fallen to Google, that Google is the one doing that kind of stuff now. And so, you know, back then we saw smart displays, media center, portable media center, you know, these smartwatch things. I mean, they were all over the map so 10 these years were, ago. You're saying these are more R, these were more kind of R&D or... Well, they were. I, Microsoft was in a position to spend a lot of money, right? And actually put stuff out and just see what kind see of what stuck. Happened. Yeah, um, Leo, none of it stuck, by the way. None yeah, of it. I noticed. Um, <laughs> so, but, but you, you know, know what, ten years Paul, ago, I, I, I think they're going to start doing those wackier things again now because yeah. of this special projects team that they're staffing up in Microsoft Research. Like they even right. said, I, I interviewed the head of Microsoft Research this week, and he said we also need to do more wacky stuff. And he meant yep. kind of like Google X, you know, like. Self-driving cars and that kind of stuff. So, well, Microsoft yeah, I, has I a big R and D division, don't they? They do, but you know, until fairly recently, it's kind of been becoming increasingly almost like an arm of their product teams. And he he wants to balance that out. He said, Peter Lee, who who's running Microsoft Research, he said we need to do some wacky stuff and we need to do some very applied Wait stuff that goes into our products. He actually used the word wacky. He used wacky. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, as wacky and wild. <laughs> Yeah. Really? Wackier. Really? He used the word wacky? Come on. He said, we, we need what to still he, do some year wackier. 80-year-old man? <laughs> <laughs> we need well, yeah, to get wacky. <laughs> oh, come on. We, last week we talked about how they were like Bell Labs or whatever. I mean, you know, you can go to that Break Microsoft out, house. Bell the Labs future. used the word wacky for Unix. <laughs> Back in the 70s, maybe. I mean, I don't <laughs> I know. I just, I, I, it's clear they're sitting on a lot of stuff that doesn't see the light of day, except in very... Yeah kind of esoteric ways. I mean, you find out these things like, you know, we figured out a way to uh, deduplicate data on a server. And it's not very interesting. It's actually very important. And it's one of the reasons right. they can have things like OneDrive and OneDrive for Business today. But, you know, they, the the more kind of big idea stuff, you don't really hear a lot about that from out of Microsoft. And they do need to productize that stuff. They do. So uh, Misha Barton uh, was a star Misha of Barton. OC. Yeah, see? Yeah. What did I say? I said something close to that. Something like that. He did. Uh, yeah, the anorexic uh, blonde woman from a TV show. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she, she was apparently a big enough deal in 2004 that they used her when they launched the spot yeah. watch. That spot, spot watch would have she destroyed was, this one. Okay, She's, so she, she was 18 like then. Months. And that's, yeah. so that tells you that they were trying to get the young folk. Sure. Right? So there you go. That explains yeah. it. But yeah, this is a patent from uh, Microsoft applied for this patent back in t 2012 for this smart smartwatch, and uh, it just got approved, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which uh, is funny because it, it does everything that every smartwatch on earth now does. It does. They call yeah. it a wearable information system. So it has all the other basic things that you'd expect, you know, like a touchscreen, a heartbeat monitor, all that kind of stuff. But they're going to call we it the wacky watch. The wacky watch. <laughs> I'm hoping they call it the Zoom watch. <laughs> oh man! Now in Whoa. brown. <laughs> now in brown. <laughs> um, you know that's interesting that they got a patent. Boy, the patent office sucks. Right. It's uh, you, <laughs> not the I mean, biggest problem in this country, but it's in the top it's, ten. It's a big. Really. I just read yeah, that 94 percent of all patents, 94 percent of all patents applied for last year were granted. Wow. I bet that 94% of all patents have a prior use that would invalidate them. Like mm, slide to unlock. 
which was patented yeah. two years like before every Apple patent. did. We, yeah, yeah. Every, every patent we've ever heard of. 94%. I mean, so basically means just, you know, apply. What happens, the patent office claims 54%, but what happens is 54% are approved on the first try. Then people go like back and rewrite. Uh, Windows phone apps, Leo. They yeah. get just get... They sell right through. <laughs> sell through. It's called sell through, and it's a, it's a new goal at the patent office. We, yeah, exactly. We, we want to approve every patent we get, and we're getting close. <laughs> I th I truly think that what has happened is that the, by the way, the, the commissioner of patents, the person in charge of USPTO is a former Googler, just wanted to warn you. Are you serious? Uh, yeah. I learned uh, a lot. What? Yeah, How was that what, what? 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 <laughs> Ah! Um, but I, I do think that they that the, what their attitude is is you know just grant the patent and we'll set it, settle it in court, mm -hmm. and that's a terrible thing to do. But I guess they don't have the the examiners. The examiners don't know what's going on. They don't have a searchable database. Apparently, that's why the Microsoft the uh, Apple slide to unlock got through because they probably they, hand stamp everything. I think <laughs> I think you're right. I think this is it, you, it's unbelievable. Anyway. Approved. <laughs> <laughs> you know. They have one stamp that says approved. Right. They have to hand <laughs> write, that, reject. Maybe that's the problem. They can't afford a rejected sticker or whatever uh, stamp. All right. So you think they'll announce the smartwatch at this event on May 20th in the meat packing district? No. I don't you, think so. No. Do you? No. Yeah. A lot of people have speculated whether they would launch a, a Surface phone at this event. Right. Um, and I'm hearing no to that as a well. Surface so. phone. Sure. Just that would be a brand name made by Nokia. I, I don't the know. The 930. Right. I mean, yeah, the reason I don't think they do either of those is they just did buy Nokia's handset division. So you'd think they'd want to have a little time to figure out what they're going right, to keep and right. what duplicates what, right? So I, I think yeah. it's a little too early for them to do either of those. I mean, Microsoft had apparently developed a prototype of a phone, but it wasn't clear. If it was meant to be a reference design they could show to OEMs or if it was something they were considering building themselves, you know, that kind of thing. Um, of course, Stephen Elop runs this part of Microsoft now, including the, the part that used to be Nokia. So I suppose anything's possible, but I, I, I just don't see that happening. And I've heard nothing about that. You know what I wish I had a patent on? <laughs> the audio book. Nice. That would be a patent to have. Unfortunately, <laughs> nice. Audible owns this space, baby. And boy, do they own it. And you know what? They're doing a good job at it. Audible.com. I'm going to get you a free audio book. Oh, look, a new book narrated by Claire Danes, star of Homeland. Super sci-fi sale, 100 plus books, six ninety five each. I just love Audible books audible.com i've been meaning to get this graham nash i'm told this is really good graham nash's new autobiography wild tales of rock and roll life let me add i'm going to add that to my wish list this is what you do when you're an audible subscriber you just browse around it's like going to the world's greatest bookstores oh neil young has a new one keith carradine narrating perfect i add that to my wish list too i love the rock and roll books Audible has 150,000 titles, not just, uh, you know, autobiographies, although there's a lot of them, and I love reading those. Fiction, nonfiction, murder, thrillers, <laughs> the Women's Murder Club is back. James Patterson has a new one. Nowadays, when a new one comes out, it comes out uh, at the same time uh, as uh, the hardcover, it comes out at Audible. There's so many things you can listen to. The new Terry Pratchett, Discworld. Dark Tower 6. Is this new? Mm -hmm. oh, uh -huh. oh, man. Wait, huh? Huh? Yeah. I, no, that's old. That's, that's an old one. Thank God I can't buy any more. It's the next to last novel in his seven volume magnum opus. If you're a Stephen King fan, supposedly, you've got, you know, you can't. It starts with the Dark Tower. Paul, what are you listening to these days? No oh, man, Leo. I, so I after the latest Daniel Suarez book came out, I, I, I went Daniel back Fox. and I Love started it. listening to Demon <gasps> and I think great. Again. I think great. So those two books um, are among the best books I've ever read, and the audio, the audible versions in particular, because all four of Daniel Suarez's books are read by the same guy, 
uh, Jeff Gurner, and he does an, an amazing job. I mean, it, it just from a presentation standpoint, are just fantastic. Um, I, and I, I know I recommended these years ago whenever they first came out, but um, I'm about halfway through Freedom TM right now. Those are fantastic. Um, somebody had recently asked me via email about audiobooks, and the one uh, another one I finished recently uh, finally was that Stephen King book, actually, 112263. Oh, isn't that good? I like that. Um, it's a great book, but it's also read by a guy who, uh, it's kind of strange, like a lot of Stephen King books take, at least part of it takes place in the past. And this guy, uh, his name is Craig Wass and does an amazing job with that so kind of good. story. There's something about so his voice good. that just lends itself to that. Yeah. Um, he also read Full Dark, No Stars, and there's a story in there in 1922 that takes place in 1922. And if I were to point someone to just like, here's a kind of a, it's a long story, not a short story, like a novella, but... You know, you want something digestible. You just want to hear one thing and, and kind of get into audiobooks. So there's something about his reading that is, is just kind of amazing. And so I think there's something interesting that happens when you get a good author slash narrator combination. So um, right now I am listening to Freedom TM, but any of those are just amazing. This is, the problem is narrowing it down. Yeah, I know. Yeah, somebody asked me about World War II audible <laughs> oh. books, and I went back and looked yeah. at them. And, of course, these things are all... 35 to 45 oh, hours so long. so good. They're amazing. And I, I I, have a really hard time remembering, you know, this was the one that had this information. And this one over here was the one that I, I don't remember. But, you know, I've got five or six of those books that were all published in the past decade because of all, you know, the new information that's come out. And uh, that's pretty much the rest of your year right there. If you want to if you want to go down that road, uh, free book awaits you. Go to audible.com slash windows. Take advantage of the uh, gold plan. 30 days free. First book is free. You also get the daily digest of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal read to you as you drive to work. Uh, cancel any time in the first 30 days. You'll pay nothing, but those books are yours to keep. Gauchem was saying that uh, Audible's been a, a godsend for his uh, vision impaired uh, uh, mom. And yeah, I, I did the same thing for my mom. She's not vision impaired, but you know, as you get older, it's harder to read. And listening just brings these books to life. She listens all day now, which is uh, awesome. Somebody also asked, "Is The Martian available?" This was Brian Brushwood's recommendation on uh, on Twit on Sunday. Absolutely, it's my next listen. Actually, I'm listening to Flash Boys right now, the story of high frequency trading. Um, but uh, The Martian's my next Audible. So here's the problem: pick one. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? There's another month and another month and another month. And you just, yeah. once you get, I've been an Audible member since 2000. You will be sucked in. Audible.com slash Windows. Don't say we didn't warn you. Paul Thorat, Mary Jo Foley, Windows Weekly on the air. Moving on uh, in our list of topics. Intel. How dare they? <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> Bastards have turned on Microsoft. They're doing Chromebooks. In fact, they look pretty nice. Are these atom based? What are these? No, well, some of them are, right? Um, there, there's three chipsets involved, and I think the news story here is that one of those three is like Core i3. So this is like wow. a serious chipset. Powerful. But it's um, yeah. a, new, a new version of the Bay Trail, which is a uh, kind of a system on a chip, atom uh, system. Celeron, which is a um, current generation atom technology, I believe. And then Core i3. And so these things are all coming out over this year. Um, it's interesting because these machines um, still ship with just a little bit of storage. You know, 16 gig is very normal. Um, sp fairly small amounts of RAM. Usually low res screens, you know, 1366 by 768. But they're full featured kind of, well, full, I should say, full size kind of laptop type machines. And... Um, I don't know. You know, I, I talk to people from uh, PC makers all the time. And the one thing I've heard consistently is that um, Chromebooks are going nowhere fast with businesses. But they're going somewhere really fast with schools and with individuals. One percent <clears throat> last year of all new school yeah. purchases were Chromebooks. Um, and, you know, it's funny because some of the people I've talked to have been very open about the fact that um, these things really are kind of the new netbook. But at least in this country, the education sector in particular is very cash strapped. And I, I think they see, you know, technology, especially or any kind of purchase through the, the lens of cost, not just first, but only. And they, you know, they look at these machines and they think, yeah, we can do this. And, uh, you know, they're online and all that kind of stuff. And they're being used in uh, lab type situations. 
a lot of those machines are kind of ruggedized for children. Um, and they're seeing success there. And so I, I, this, you know, kind of phenomenon with Chrome OS and Chromebooks tied with higher end uh, internals from Intel is absolutely a threat uh, to Microsoft. And I think this may explain the recent licensing changes in part that we saw from Microsoft where machines that are $250 or less are now, uh, you can get Windows for free. I think this was meant to combat what we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah. The, the pitch on Chrome books, and Microsoft knows this because they've hired the pawn stars to point it out, and mm -hmm. I've seen it, I continue <clears throat> to see it in their advertising is, um, yeah. you know, the Chrome books are really, it's not about the fact that they're less expensive, I think. It's that they're really simple, secure, um, you know, people, I, God, I get calls all the time on the radio show from people yeah, who go, yeah. I, uh, I can't update Windows because I had to update one and I don't know. And they're just confused. And it's not that they, it's just confusing for normal people. I can't yeah. walk them through it. It's too hard for them to figure out. And, right. no, uh, I, and I say, get absolutely. a Chromebook. You'll be, all you're doing is surfing and reading email. What do you need a multi, uh, you know, a general purpose device for? If you have, you know, 250 or $300 to spend uh, on a computing device, you know, obviously you can get a, um, a mini tablet and those are good for some people. I think for a lot of kids, uh, you know, uh, younger people, um, depending on your needs, that's a nice machine to have, but you know, some people need the big screen just to see it. Some people need the full size keyboard because they do have to type whatever it may be. Um, and I think most of these things, you know, contrary to the kind of portable form factor that you see are in fact used at, in the home or out in a schoolroom, you know, they're not, I don't believe they're taken to airports and yeah, I never see Chromebooks in the air. You know, I don't see people using them on the go, but you know, that's going to change because the other half of the story, of course, is that Google is on its own little rapid release cycle and they've been upgrading uh, Chrome OS at a very rapid rate. We see a lot more offline apps and we see these kind of native app capabilities coming to Chrome as well. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that, as Microsoft is also pushing this notion that HTML is a viable platform for applications, you know, Google has this in Chrome OS and it, it that reality has made, you know, Chrome OS is a, a viable reality as well. And so, you know, a couple, I have a, just a quick note about, we didn't talk about this and why would we, but, you know, with the MacBook Air now starting at just $900, cheapest portable Mac ever made. You know, you've got this, you can see this window now that we have for PCs where, you know, 250 and below is kind of mini tablets and Chrome OS. And now 900 bucks and above is pretty much the realm of the Mac. You know, I think that's the, that's the part of the market where the Mac sells really well uh, compared to Windows PCs. Because you can look at Macs versus Windows PCs overall and it's, a, you know, 7, 8%. But I bet in the $1,000 plus market, uh, they're like 50% or something. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a much, much, much higher yeah, percentage. Yeah. And so now we think, see the effect. So where does, where does Microsoft market. go in that, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think where they go is that is they, is they develop Windows on ARM more fully, yeah. right? Like this to me is their answer to Chromebooks going forward, which is have right. a skew of Windows, which is very locked down. Um, well, that that's the key. Again, remember, right. the Chromebook is popular not merely because it's cheap but because it's simple it, and it's, secure it's no yeah. it's basically no maintenance it's it's, it's funny because it's right. familiar it looks like windows right yeah. but it doesn't have any of it the does what, or, what right. like 90 percent of people doing it with windows anyway and right. so this pawn stars <laughs> thing i think is yeah. a is a macguffin i don't think that they're not yeah. taking it in an airplane you're right paul but but not yeah. yet but they maybe, could. maybe i mean you know it, 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 over time so it does yeah. have price going for it but more importantly it's got simplicity going. So can Microsoft, Mary Jo, can Microsoft do something that simple? Yeah, I think I think that we know that they're trying to build a new SKU of Windows uh, that probably is a Windows 9 thing that is going to be a, an updated version of what right now is Windows RT. So it's going to be more locked down, more simple. Um, things are going to be updated without user intervention necessary through the, through the store. It's going to be the same SKU basically that also runs on phones. Um, and th then yeah. by that point, you're going to start to be able to have a common store for phones and, and uh, Windows. And but by definition, that wouldn't have a desktop, right? Right. That by definition would not have a desktop. So, you know, then if once we get to that point, you don't have that experience where you're being switched from one thing to another. Um, 
right now in, on Windows RT, that's for Office apps only pretty much. I mean, there's a few things that also run in the desktop, but this would be like no desktop. You're running the Gemini apps and it's a very, very simple, very locked down, um, very modern to use their word environment. Yeah. And I think that's and, what they're going to try to pitch against Chromebooks. Every, you know, a lot of people make fun of uh, Surface because it's this tablet that has these click on keyboards and everything. But I, I think the interesting thing about a fully realized Surface plus this kind of Windows minus desktop OS is that it can do either one of those things. You know, that a, a future Surface running this OS could be, a, a you know, the, the Chromebook style OS, you know, Chromebook style laptop type thing. But you can detach the keyboard and it's a, it's a nice tablet, too. Um, you know, I they, think that they could really uh, ease a lot of pain by doing this because there are still people yeah. who buy Windows machines because Windows is a personal computer. So that's what you buy. And it's sure. way more than they should have, way more than they need, completely baffling to them. Yep. yep. But it, they would buy a an Explorer book. They, they're they nervous about a Chromebook. They're nervous about an iPad. They think yeah. that yeah, a computer yeah. means Windows. So give them Windows, but it's really just, you know, a browser, something simple, clean. Yeah. And I guess Metro apps are fine, right? That people know well, it's, it's, it's a mobile environment, is what it is. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's a it's like Android. It's a little bit more like Android, yeah. but it, you know, has it has Office, obviously. But, but that's I, not I what know. Chromebooks are. I mean, Chromebooks really feel like, as you said, they look like when they feel like a computer. No, it, right, but the, but again, you know, the world is changing, and so there's a little bit of user education that's required here. But um, you can there are machine like Android machines that have like keyboards. You can attach a keyboard to right. an iPad. I mean, it's possible. You know. Uh, those things probably but work We always okay. asked, why doesn't Google, why is Google doing two OSs? Why are they doing Chromebook and yeah. Android? Because clearly Android would do everything a Chromebook does. Right. And the Although, reason is because I think, because they think people want a, a, a computer. <laughs> right. I, I Right. And I'm sort of coming around to that myself because uh, I think it was HP uh, had l sort of released a video about some uh, Chrome-based laptop that they're coming out with. And you, when you look at Chrome on that thing, you see, it, it's it's funny how off it seems like it just doesn't seem very natural um whereas chrome os does have a you know it's a familiar it's got something that looks like a start menu it's got yeah. something that looks like a taskbar yeah. it's got a desktop Apps you know or on the taskbar um yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean so i that don't, helps don't people tell anybody make, the make the transition yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> right i'm running what but i think maybe it, it really is the year of desktop linux it, it, i think it is yeah. so you think Microsoft might do this? Do well. I mean, doesn't it under? Oh, the other the um, other argument is it undermines the brand. What is Windows then? Sure. Yeah. What isn't Windows, Leo? <laughs> I, I was going to say they can call anything Windows. <laughs> well, I know right? they can, but then they confuse. It's oh, Windows yeah. branded yogurt. Yep. Yeah. They. I mean, they can call Windows RT Windows, right? Or whatever this next version yep. of Windows on ARM is. They could just call it Windows. I mean, and the, um, the truth. You know, the, the truth is, yeah. Intel doing this is really just Intel throwing up its arms and saying, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting just eaten alive by uh, ARM. We right. Just, and, yeah. and Intel has seen no uh, success at all in the mobile device no, market. You know, no. they've they've tried and they've tried. We, Mary Jo and I last week got a um, like a low end Acer tablet that runs on Intel. Right. Have you tried this thing, Mary Jo? Have you looked at yeah, this? Yeah, I have been trying it out. Yeah. And so it's okay, right? But I think yeah. you would agree it's a little slow. It's a little pokey. Yep. It's, you know, yep. nothing special. Yeah. Um, I don't think that hardware makers have any particular incentive to go with Intel when there are so many oh. excellent ARM yeah. systems oh. that are specially tailored for what they're making, right. you know? Yeah. And so the Chromebook is a way for them to pick up a little bit of volume uh, as yeah. the PC market uh, slows down. It feels like desperation. <laughs> and my and by the way, kudos to Microsoft for doing for for seeing this coming and saying we're going to do an ARM version of Windows. Right. That was right. a good move. Turns out that was a good move. Yep. It, yep. right it had been a long well, it's, time. It's only a good move making. if it's successful. Well, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and you know, I think I think you know next year when we see this new variant that they come out with for Windows on ARM, whatever it looks like. Uh, uh, I think it'll be like the version two of, of Windows on ARM, right? It'll be different from what Windows RT is in some ways. Hopefully there will be an easy upgrade path, but we don't really know how that's going to work for us who have ARM-based devices now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> wouldn't get too hopeful on that note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying, to, trying to be hopeful there. Um, sure. But, yeah. Um, 
And then, you know, like people always say about Microsoft, it always takes them three versions to get something right. So we'll be at version two next year. And, 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 and to be fair, I mean, I, I, I think that for RT, this is kind of what they envisioned and they knew it was a multi-step process. You know, yeah. Yeah. the first step is just to deliver this thing that is Windows. That right. kind of blows people's minds. You know, like this is this is yeah. Windows. It looks and feels and works just like Windows. Uh, and they the had to still have the desktop because right. they didn't have that, the yeah. Office apps They just ready. didn't have that stuff. Yeah, right. right. Oh, so they can. Yeah, so Windows, it now, Windows right. had to mature. You know, the modern environment had to mature, and Office had to happen. Right. Yeah. Um, but it will, and all that stuff is happening, and so you know they'll get there. Joe B, <laughs> who is Joe B, and why is everybody talking? About him? <laughs> you have a picture of him right in your office somewhere. That guy with the oh, hair. Oh, Mr. Yeah. Belfiore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The beautiful Joe Belfiore. He did an, he did an Ask Me Anything on Reddit? He did. Yep. Did, was he forthcoming? I guess he would be. A little bit. It uh, seemed like he was prepped yeah. for hoping that people would ask certain questions, you know. Um, <laughs> did they ask about yeah. the hair yeah. or anything? I mean, they, they did. did. What was his response? He said, luckily, it's a very simple style, just shampoo, conditioner, and towel dry. Uh, well, that's a good reason. So I just want to I just want to add a note to that. Um, as a man, uh, that he's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it, look there's like no, there's he no just way towels that, that dry. You can tell when people spend time on their hair. That's all I'm saying. I'm, but, I'm okay. thinking 100 brush strokes a night for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's like Marsha Brady. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. But maybe he's yeah. got a special kind of hair that just does that. Mine wouldn't. Mine yeah, looked pretty frizzy I if I did that. I refuse to believe that's true. And after all, Paul, as a, as a nicely coiffed male, yes, it's not so hard to run a comb through your hair. I I, I don't even own a comb, Leo. I, <laughs> but, I brush my yes. hair every day. Wash, dry, you and You know brush. what, I, Leo? I come out of the shower and it's like the fun. You're just like, yep. Hey. Hey. <laughs> there hey. it is. Not my fault. Perfect. My hair just looks like this every morning. Mm -hmm. yep. You're a beautiful man. Don't ever change. What else did Joe <laughs> B. tell us? Right. Um, his big news was there is going to be a Microsoft developed file manager app for Windows Phone 81. It's going to be called Norton Commander. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what's <laughs> crazy about this? It's I, I think Paul and I both kind of were like, yeah, I, I don't really care about that. But man, there are a lot of people who care. Really? Because yeah. aren't there like 1,800 you know third-party choices in this market? There, when, there, when, with this mobile world, a lot of the people that used to be like Windows-type geeks are yeah. migrating to Android because that's the kind of technical, you can hack anything, do anything you want right. kind of system. And one of the things that Android has, or you can get for Android, multiple copies of, is like file manager Yeah, but they don't make a, a, a default. There isn't a, a Google one. No, I know, but a lot of um, you download uh, like Samsung devices ship with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ship, yeah. You know. yeah. So... I, honestly, it's funny because the day the day this was announced, I wrote an article about file management in eight <laughs> one, and I I don't one hundred percent see the need for this. Um, Doesn't isn't excuse me, but that's what Explorer does, right? I'm am I mistaken? Yeah, but on phone, right? Like I I'm, oh, this I'm is not for the phone. Okay, I don't yeah. quite get what the point of this is. Uh, you know, no. In fact, Apple very explicitly does not offer or support file managers because they don't think you should see the operate the file right. system. Which is why Microsoft yeah. should have this thing, by the right. way, because right. they're, they're just <laughs> not Apple. provide an yeah. op alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if, but people you. were excited about that. That was a big announcement. Okay. What else did he what say? Else? He said um, they're talking to Snapchat about doing an app for Windows Phone, but he didn't promise anything there. Uh, he said there's going to be the updated version of the Facebook app for a windows phone 8.1 out by june he's he's hopeful did he say what that entailed i don't believe he did wait a minute isn't there a facebook app on my windows phone yeah no it comes with it right yeah. in eight one because that, that's how integration occurs but it comes but from microsoft cool. right it's not uh well yeah anyway, what's he microsoft. talking about here that right I, well said, an updated version of it yeah Right, an updated version that'll take advantage of how how they're now doing the um, uh, social network integration. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So uh, because they made changes to that, that Facebook's they're, now going to work with that. Uh, it's actually that ironic. I prefer the Facebook, the old Facebook version on Windows. <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah, right? yeah. but the, but the thing to understand is, you know, under that old system, as good as that was, it just couldn't move forward. Right, and right. there was no way to update that thing. 
And I, 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 every time I do this thing in Windows Phone 8 one now where you, you know, I want to share this with Facebook and then the Facebook app kind of loads, you know, like, ugh, like, okay. But you know what? At least you know it's going to be updated. And I think that June date probably applies equally well to Twitter and LinkedIn, right? That uh, anything that can integrate into... Because it's so tightly integrated. In yeah. that fashion. Well, it, it has to because June is when this system will become widely available Got to it. consumers, right? Got it. Yeah. Most likely, I think. Okay. So uh, they need to have that stuff rolling by the time it's, you know, the system is out there. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, he talked a lot about just kind of the thinking behind why Microsoft's done certain things that they have with Windows Phone. Because, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of questions about Zoom and what, why did you guys screw up the whole music experience? And <laughs> right. why did you have to undo the parts that were working? When are you going to bring back <laughs> Media Center? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he took on a lot of those questions. He didn't tell us anything brand new on any of those, but um, he, it, it was interesting he at least addressed them instead of just avoiding them. That was good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was just the, the kind of standard complaints, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and also crazy complaints. You know, why doesn't yeah. Microsoft admit that they're behind Android in some ways? Or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Why don't you guys <laughs> just go home? Yeah, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's we'll start home. an ad campaign that describes all the ways in which we don't measure up to the <laughs> yeah, competition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, that's just right. Yeah, he got asked about the um, enthusiast program and why, why did you guys take so long to finally do that and... Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it was I know just Joey like, yeah, said, enthusiast program, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all enthusiasts, really? Yeah. Don't we all care deeply? I was really, that got me to buy a Windows 8 phone so I could put yeah. 8.1 on it. Right. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, I, to be fair, they eventually got that very right. Yeah, <laughs> you I know, so. And that, that is what enables us to get the 8.1 update yeah. right now. It's I like great. it. I think it's a very smart thing for them to do. Yep. Yeah. Not oh, yeah, and they added a um, Cortana user voice site. I, I don't know if that was actually brand new or not, but if you have features you want to see them add in Cortana, ah. um, you can go there and mm -hmm. actually give them the suggestion and people can vote on it. That so is good. also oh, a good idea. That should have been my tip this week. You know, they have various user voice sites now for Windows Phone 8.1, uh, for Cortana in particular, for Xbox Music. And I bet there are others that I'm not aware of yet. Um Everything at Microsoft should be like that. They, yeah. they, they should yeah. open up the, you know, the floodgates. I'm with you on that. Yep. Because that's exactly what Apple doesn't do. And Google really doesn't do that either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's an opportunity. Make yourself friendly to enthusiasts, mm -hmm. to people sure. who yep. care. And they, they will, will move right along if you don't. <laughs> I mean, well, they, right. But they, but, and they will, and they will promote you if you do. Yeah. Yep. They'll, they'll well, file it. the file manager app is an example of that. Yeah, that was yeah, a yeah. huge, yep. huge vote, vote upvoted one on uh, the user <laughs> voice. So, and I guarantee you, there are people, uh, the people at Microsoft who had thought about this thing three years ago, said there is zero need for this. Right, there yeah. is, and there is zero <laughs> need is, for it. If you think about how bulky it is to, you know, go into a folder somewhere, select some files, navigate all the way back out, go into some other folder, <laughs> select paste or whatever you're doing. On a phone. Like, that is just a ridiculous series. And there's no reason stupid. for it. And by the way, PC, Google, you could, I mean, with it, the release yeah. of KitKat, broke that. <laughs> file okay. file browsers oh, wow. don't work on SD cards anymore oh, because they okay. enforced permissions all of a yeah, sudden yeah, on yeah. SD cards, mm -hmm. which, which, by the way, is the right thing to do. Uh, well, on, on, on Windows, Windows Phone A1 handles SD storage in a very elegant fashion. In fact, I, in testing some stuff last week, I discovered that, um, you know, you can move... Items obviously back and forth between the two. So you can, if you put an SD card, it says, "Hey, you have an SD card. Do you want to use it?" You say, "Yeah, sure." And then you get a little menu of the things you might want to use it for. A lot of people will want to use it for kind of everything. And so, going forward, as you install apps, for example, they will install to the SD card if that's what you want it to do. From then on, you, that just becomes the yeah, default. Oh, just, I if love you want that. it to, if you want it to. That but you can also great. go into the utility and select apps from the machine and say, "Move these onto the card," mm -hmm. and. Um, a couple of the built-in apps won't go, but most of them will. And if you were to pop the card out, those apps still appear on your start screen, but they're like grayed out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, it's it's really well yeah. done. I yeah. mean, it's just it doesn't like break everything. You yeah, know, it's that's just nice. I uh, the store the, the the point of a file manager is uh, fairly negligible. I don't understand the point of it, yeah. but make them happy. 
Yeah, I think it is literally just a path to your door. Yeah. Yeah. People have it. Yep. You know who recently made me pretty damn happy? (laughs) (laughs) If you're guessing Uh, ziprecruiter.com, you nailed it, my friends. (laughs) I I was I have to admit I was not guessing that. (laughs) (laughs) We uh (laughs) <laughs> we, we recently uh, were searching for a very important position within the Twit Brickhouse Studios. And, oh, my goodness, the idea of going from uh, from job site to job site one by one and posting. And you kind of, you know, you don't really know which job site, which place to go is going to get you the best results, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then we found ZipRecruiter. And the idea is you post once on ZipRecruiter.com. And then they post it on 50-plus job boards. They also put it on LinkedIn, of course. You got to do that. Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus. This is all automatic. They set you up uh, with a page with your company logo and colors, so it you know it doesn't look like a ZipRecruiter page. It looks like yours. You can add uh, an instant job page to your website with their help, and it includes a company careers page, so you can use that as a careers link. And this is the stuff HR uh, folks have been just dying for. It really is a great solution, and it includes now social recruiting too. So you really uh, you're getting you're getting everywhere. Uh, embrace the mobile job seeker. They have mobile optimized pages too. You can view and share formatted resumes. In fact, ZipRecruiter will automatically highlight the best candidates, so you screen them, rate them, and hire the right person fast. Try ZipRecruiter today if uh, if you're looking to hire. ZipRecruiter.com, over 100,000 businesses have used them. If you visit ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows, we'll set you up with four days free. Four days free, our special offer at ZipRecruiter, Z-I-P-R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R, ZipRecruiter.com slash Windows. Fill that job fast. We did with ZipRecruiter.com. Moving along in the Windows saga, um... (laughs) We talked about this a little bit on uh, yesterday on Security Now, the uh, XP zero day, f- or I'm sorry, the Internet Explorer zero day flaw, which right. Microsoft fixed for all versions of Windows, including XP. Is that, and there is some debate, is that Microsoft right. blinking or is it in fact just patching IE, not patching XP? Well, IE is part of XP, Leo, so I, <laughs> I would have to say they patched XP. But Would you, but I mean, yeah. do you think that that breaks their, you know, pledge not to yep. I guess yes it does. yes <laughs> it does you're both in agreement on that well and they no, and they said it i mean they came out and said it you know uh we said we weren't going to do this and we did and, and but did they welcome. say and don't ever count ca- ca- we're never going to do it again they literally said this is an exception we are never yeah. doing this again okay yeah. and why would they make that exception they said it was because it was so soon after the end of uh-huh. support but they also have been warning people that guys, you know what, there could be a huge problem right after we end support if you haven't upgraded. So they kind of knew right, this could right, have happened, and right. they still did patch it. But you know what, I I just think whatever they did there, they they couldn't win. If they didn't patch right. it, there would have been a huge outcry. Right. If they And they did, and people criticized them. I, know, I don't understand that, frankly. Uh, well, okay, but <laughs> Say you know, I, you. I, actually, I do understand it, because I mean, you know, when you watch Microsoft as closely as uh, Mary Jo and I do, you know that you know this company has gone through these kind of varied various periods and we're still on the trailing edge of that microsoft can do no right era you know that um satya nadella for all of his you know sunshine and hope and and youngness and goodness uh has not erased the fact that a lot of people just distrust microsoft and right. uh don't think they'll ever get anything right, right. and uh, and you just see it's 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 so instant it's like feral i mean it the crazy reactions to them doing something that it, it is basically a gift, <laughs> you know. I mean, they supported an operating system, a desktop operating system for, you know, thir- almost 13 years. Um, I, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, <and> shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Microsoft. You know, I mean, I, oh, it's crazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, the, I did see some people say, I don't know if it was Dr. Pizza's article or somebody said, the problem here is 
a lot of it's around IT, right? Because a lot of IT departments have gone to their bosses and said, guys, we've got to upgrade yes. because they're not going to patch us anymore. And then what happens? They patch it, right? Oh, and so now, now, now your you look, boss goes, oh, hey, you know see? what? We're just going to stay there. I told you they'd never, I told you they'd blink. Yep. Yep. I knew okay. it. Well, I knew they'd can't, blink. They can't win on that one. Those guys will be rolling out Chrome OS in three months. <laughs> Yeah, they're not loyal. You're not loyal. Don't fool me. You don't fool me for an instant. I also, you know, I, I get these uh, really, of course, you know, I write for Windows IT Pro. So a lot of the the, the readers out there are, are IT based and are, you know, uh, work for big enterprises and everything. And I get these occasionally really belligerent emails about how they're good Microsoft customers and, you know, Microsoft should treat customers like this. And you know, I, I have a newsflash for you. If you haven't upgraded your OS uh, since 2001, <laughs> you're not really a uh, you're not a great you're not really a great customer. I, I, I <laughs> you know, I, I you may be a good customer of Dell, who you know you've been buying machines from for the past 13 years and then blowing it away and putting XP on there. But I, I just don't I, this this whole kind of mentality around XP is so crazy. Yeah, it really is unsuitable. Uh, for the modern computing world, it just is, and and you know this notion that it still works is like yeah yeah a horse still works, but I don't you know we don't <laughs> use it to get to work every day like you know it, it's it really is kind of crazy. Um, you don't have to look too hard to see the differences between uh, different versions of Windows or Office. I mean I'm uh, doing some stuff with the Office Garage guys, and we were looking at the differences between Office. 2010 and 2013 and you know you may look at them side by side and think these things aren't all that different but when when you get into it you realize there are fairly profound differences and that's the last version i mean when you go back to the one that came out 11 12 years ago i mean it's almost laughable is there something special about xp you don't hear people saying you know hey why aren't you patching windows 95 right no it, it, it the specialness is that through means that were sort of arbitrary and coincidental it was kept in the market for a long time. You know, so uh, they could have, have marketed well, SP2 right. as a separate Windows netbooks version. Netbooks had a lot of the early netbooks had XP. Well, and then uh, Windows Vista, which was Longhorn, took forever to come to market. Right. And so you had this kind of thing where they they stretched it out once with its SP2, and then because of the longevity of the development of Longhorn, and then the reaction of Vista after it came out, and the rise of netbooks, like you said. I mean, all of a sudden you get this thing that might have been in the market three or four years, five mm -hmm. years. It's been like 10, 12. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, uh, I keep saying this, you know, people forget how lousy XP was when it first shipped. It was terrible. Yeah. And we all forget that. We're all such huge fans of XP. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a strange relationship. I don't know what to say. Bill Gates. You've heard, <laughs> you've heard of him. I've, I've yeah, heard sounds familiar. Is, is he related somehow to that Misha Barton chick? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Billionaire philanthropist sitting down <laughs> with Warren Buffett and Fox Business Network's Liz Clayman. Liz uh, said, uh, any sense in spinning off Bing and Xbox? That's what some say Nadella should do. Gates says, certainly the Bing technology has been key to us learning how to do large-scale data centers. And Bing lets us see what's going on in the internet. I see that as a pretty fundamental technology for the company. <laughs> but Xbox? Xbox. I would flush that thing down the toilet. <laughs> so Clayman said, uh, "Well, what? Yeah, what about what about Xbox? What did that teach you, Bill? Yeah, the power of the PC. It brings <laughs> yeah. the power of the PC chip, the graphics chip, which means you could do great games." there so i'm sure satya and the team will look at that and you know it's up to them we're going to have an overall gaming strategy so it's not as obvious as you might think liz presses the chairman and says would you support nadella if he wanted to spin off xbox gates says absolutely you can't handle the truth <laughs> <laughs> absolutely that's he didn't even say yeah maybe absolutely he says i like him i well, want him back yeah <laughs> yeah. What What is he talking about? So I think there's two ways to interpret this. And one is, of course, he is going to be loyal to whatever Satya does because Satya is the CEO. And Bill Gates actually is Satya's um, advisor right now. Right. He's not the chairman of the board anymore. He's Satya's advisor. So, uh, you know, you say, OK, he's going to be loyal to the CEO and say whatever the CEO wants. Yep, we're going to do it. But you have to wonder about how certain he was on not selling Bing and how right. very yeah. uncertain he was about Xbox. Yeah. 
He said, yeah, absolutely. honestly, if you were to pull the average Microsoft customer and say, uh, we're going to get rid of one of these two things, Bing or Xbox, I bet most people would pick Bing. Yeah. You know? But and it's because they don't very... understand what Bing is to Microsoft. Oh, no, of anymore. course. I, I'm not saying that's the right answer. I'm just saying that's yeah. what people would say. And I, I think his reaction to both of those products was very interesting. It was. And, you know, there are different ways. Uh, the word spinoff freaks people out, right? They're like, oh, they're going to go sell it to Sony or they're going to go sell it to Samsung. No, uh, to me, they could just spin it out to a separate subsidiary, possibly. Um, you know, Stephen Elop, supposedly, he, he was believed to be in favor of selling off Xbox when he was up as one of the CEO candidates. Right. We, we've talked about um, that, yeah. Right. So there's ways they could and do this. What is this he in charge of now? Yeah, yeah, where did he happened to him? <laughs> yeah, what is... At least he's nowhere where he could touch that thing, right? Uh, hmm. You'd think. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it was a very peculiar way to phrase the answer to that question if you really believe that Microsoft should keep Xbox in-house. I think Xbox could be a very successful standalone business. Unfortunately. Yeah. And I, you know what? And I, then they, they still could do the software and the services. Like Microsoft could keep course. that, right? Microsoft sells the software to PC makers and device makers, uh, you know, yeah. I'm a huge believer in digital currency, yeah. and in fact... Oh, they asked uh, him about Bitcoin, too. They're involved in trying to get that going in poor countries so we can have cheap financial services, even for people without much money. But doing it on an anonymous basis, I think that leads to some abuses, so I'm not involved... So this is in an Bitcoin. interesting conversation. I guess this was at a business school. Okay, so you're not involved. I in want to find his absolutely. I want to see how, how, yeah, how, uh, how, you know, was it absolutely? Or was, uh, <laughs> Thanks for taking absolutely. my question. My name is Katrina Duncan. I'm a second year at the University of Chicago. This is, uh, I guess, a bunch of business. Uh, it's like I, uh, Bill, I'm a uh, Call of Duty gamer, and I just got a question about the Xbox. Learn a lot from a lot of the things <laughs> that you've done because you have been arguably the world's greatest investor. But uh, Bill, she's talking to. Oh wait a minute. Uh, see, I want to. I want to get the connection in that. And that's that's Warren Buffett. I guess they're buddies. They play bridge or something, uh, he's, right? He's he's re-examining all the things. He's already made some really good changes. Let's talk about uh, Nadella here. It's it's exciting to have young blood, new thinking. Well, we have young blood that is related in a way. Young to blood for new years. Look at that guy. Yeah, young is not the word I would use. Uh, but he is cool, and he. You know, still can jump over <laughs> small pieces of French. <laughs> oh, Bill Gates, yeah. Oh, you were talking about Warren Buffett? Yeah, I was talking about Buffett, yeah. He looks like a vampire. What happened there? Well, he's never been young. <laughs> he's never been young. <laughs> right. <laughs> one, one, what one, one might say young. He went through the depression in the in his middle <laughs> ages. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, OneDrive yeah. news. New features. Uh, OneDrive. Yeah, so OneDrive picked up OneDrive, meaning OneDrive in the web, uh, picked up some new features this week, and and this is a good example of a service because it exists primarily in the cloud that just kind of keeps getting better and better. Um, and most of this stuff is around photos. Uh, you can, you know, a bigger photo uh, thumbnail view, the uh, the ability to have uh, videos displayed in line with those photos, right. you know, video playback improvements. Uh, photo album customization, you know, publish videos to uh, Facebook and so on. So that's all kind of cool. Um, the one thing people, every time there's any OneDrive update I hear from people, when are they going to add the ability to see, you know, items that are shared with you in the desktop client? And I, all I can say is I know Microsoft knows about this because we've talked about it, but um, clearly this is a difficult thing to actually make happen. So that's not part of this. Um, and then there's a new version of the uh, OneDrive mobile app for Android. And uh, I don't think there's any reason to go into that too deeply, but you can grab that if you have. Well, you know, it's just it. You'd get it. It's it fun. You, you look yeah. at it. Yeah. Well, if you have, if you're, if you're using OneDrive on Android, and actually, to be honest, you know, OneDrive is one of those kind of great apps to have, no matter what device you have. If it's Android-based, Windows Phone, uh, Windows RT, or Windows 8.1, uh, iOS, you know, iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch, whatever. On all of those platforms, you can use OneDrive to back up your yeah. photos in yeah. full quality to. Yeah. To OneDrive, which is and nice. the coolest thing about that is if you have a mix, you know, you may be somebody who uses an iPhone, you have an Android tablet, you have a Windows PC, any photos that go in through that device, no matter which one it is, go into the same place, and you can get your, um, you know, your OneDrive-based camera roll. You can you could look at your pictures on your uh, Xbox One. 
or whatever device you may have. Yeah. It's nice. Nice. Um, oh, here, I just got a text message. Hi, Leo. We've begun shooting the next episode of The Newsroom, the Aaron Ooh. Sorkin show on HBO. And uh, I'd like to use twit.tv on one of the computers in the bullpen. Nice. Okay. That's cool. Go for it. Yeah. You know, we were featured. <laughs> featured. You know what that means, Leo? <laughs> what? That means you are a liberal scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him I hate the show. Um, <laughs> right, right. But we were, we were a tab in a browser on Silicon Valley. Nice. Now, that was pretty okay. good. There you go. Oh, wow. We weren't in the, we weren't, uh, you know, TechCrunch, or no, Recode was on the screen. But yeah. if you looked really closely. <laughs> yeah, you were one of the tabs. We were one of the tabs. Nice. Hey, we're getting there. Yep. Uh, I didn't mention there was a May update, or is there a May on, this, on Xbox? I missed uh, it. It's not out for the general public oh, yet, okay. but it's, yeah, I haven't seen it, you it know, yet. if, you've, if right. you've signed up for the private testing part, you can get it. Well, you would, you'd barely notice this one. It's, it's mostly around audio controls. It's not really a lot. In it. And this is another example of every time, you know, Microsoft releases an update, people come and say, what about this? What about this? You know, like uh, USB devices. Like, when am I going to be able to plug in a hard drive or a USB thumb drive and have the Xbox be able to see it? Still not an Xbox One. I don't know. You know they, they know about it. They're working on it. We'll see. Uh, finally, before we take a break, Tech Ed I thought um, that uh, Build was going to do it all, but they're still going to do Tech Ed, huh? Yep. Yeah. At least for now. Yeah. yeah. Still doing yeah. Tech Ed. Coming up in <laughs> Houston. <laughs> Microsoft is in a contest with itself to see if it can find an even more humid place to have Tech Ed. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Orlando, New Orleans. Like, what could be worse than that? Oh, right. Houston, Houston. in the summertime. What are we going to look for at uh, Tech Ed? So, um, Tech Ed's next week. Paul and I are both going to be there. Oh, you're going to Houston. And All right. Yep. Will we'll you be back Houston. before we'll the show? That. We'll both still be in Houston, but we think we both will be able to do the show from Houston. Yep. So that should work out fine. Um, it's So Tech Ed's you know, Microsoft show for IT pros and developers. Yeah. It's a combined audience. And this year we're thinking there's probably going to be some Azure news that given that it's it's just that kind of a show. But um, Rod Trent, who works with Paul um, at Windows IT Pro, wrote a very interesting piece asking a question, will Tech Ed this year be a place for IT pros? I mean, that's the audience, but these guys have been feeling kind of unloved because Microsoft's really pushing the cloud agenda, even though you can have the whole premise that um, you can have a hybrid cloud, you can still have your software running on-prem, um, their push is definitely the cloud. And there are not, as Rod pointed out in his article, there aren't that many sessions on things that are not cloud. I mean, there's definitely some sessions on things like System Center and Exchange. Uh, but for an event that's supposed to be a learning event for IT pros, there is not as much content he, fe he feels, and I think some others will probably feel, uh, that appeals directly to an IT pro audience. So it's going to be interesting to see how they play that at the show and how much emphasis there is on on-prem software and the whole IT pro messaging. Okay. I've been hearing, um, I don't know if Paul's heard this, but I've been hearing hints that, that we could possibly have some acquisition news announced at TechEd. And uh, I've yep. had people speculate maybe Xamarin, maybe finally <laughs> that acquisition could be announced there. Um so I, I what was the, how did we leave Xamarin? Because I, I, I could have sworn I had heard that that was in fact happening and that there was some kind of last minute deal where they just weren't able to get it done in time for build. Yeah, that was the rumor we heard at build. Um, okay. So now the rumor has been renewed that maybe that acquisition, if it is going to happen, could be announced at TechEd. It might because it's also a dev audience there and that would be a good place for that. Right, right. Um. I've heard other couple other company names thrown around um, in the virtualization space who Microsoft might be looking at. I've even had somebody speculate Citrix. You know that they've been a speculated speculated takeover target oh, for Microsoft for, for decades. decades. <laughs> yeah. Well, they've always been really tightly. Uh, they are. Well, but very uh, uh, there's a Citrix is an amazing story, by the way, because this is a company that at the height of Microsoft's power 
really threatened some of its major businesses. And rather than just destroy it or buy it, it Microsoft pardoned with it. Yeah. And it, it yeah. this relationship has lasted forever. I, I, I yeah. This is a very strange and exceptional example of Microsoft dealing with a company. It's, it's amazing that this, because the stuff that Citrix does really has continued to parallel what Microsoft well, doesn't does. Doesn't Microsoft license RDP from Citrix? Or they thought that that was the... Yeah, there's a whole very complex relationship between those two yeah, around that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, Citrix uh, is very widely used in enterprise for uh, yep, they sure. are. remote access. Sure. And, so forth. and, you know, uh, as we're throwing these words out there about who might be, you know, in play, the, we, these are just pure guesses and pure speculation. I don't have anybody who I would consider a verifiable source saying this is going to happen, just so everybody's clear who's listening. But you have heard I don't the rumor see a that there, there will be acquisition hey. news. Yeah, at the yeah, we have heard rumors about acquisition news, huh. but you know, um, last week Microsoft bought a company uh, called Green Button. Uh, they're based in New Zealand. They own and the, they... the patent for green buttons. <laughs> no, they do not. Not to be confused with the Green Button, which was that media center enthusiast right. community. Uh, oh, what not is that this? Green Button either. No, they they are a New Zealand um, cloud computing vendor, and Microsoft. They've also been a long time Microsoft partner. They bought them because they have a product that actually lets you take an enterprise app and more easily get it to uh, the cloud and cloud enable it. So they're supposedly going to take that technology and integrate that with Azure going forward. So those are the kinds of companies I think Microsoft's more looking at, especially offshore companies to use their offshore cash. Um, companies ah, that are kind of small, right. right? They don't small have to repatriate the money to use it. Yep. Yeah, sure. that makes so, sense. Yeah. So yeah, if you're in Luxembourg, you're in good shape you're this week. You're golden today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This just in: Citrix is moving to Indonesia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice to Luxembourg. Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll watch. And you guys, so TechEd is for IT professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. To kind of keep them up on their and, skills, and developers, like a, I guess. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. There's going to be quite a few developer sessions there. And in fact, my codename pick of the week has to do with that. So I'll save okay. that up. But um, you guys yeah, doing a meetup down there? Or are you gonna yeah, we, we, we decided not to do something formal at TechEd. And right. we, but we definitely think we're going to be hanging out at this. But really we're definitely great going to be drinking. And so <laughs> we're going to hang out and drink at the yeah. place, a place called the Flying Saucer, which is a really great craft beer bar in Houston near the show, probably on Tuesday. So if anybody's around and they want to come have a beer with us. Yeah, we'll, we'll tweet about it good. to make sure we have the details yeah. down. But, uh, yeah, probably Tuesday. It's the Flying Saucer Draft Emporium <laughs> in uh, beautiful Houston. Yeah. You know, we should have uh, three decent meetup opportunities over the next couple of months, right? So we've got mm -hmm. Tekka next week and New York the week after. Yeah. And, and then in July we're going to D.C., right? For the Worldwide I Partnership. Think, I don't know if we have a um, an exact daytime place yet, but uh, that week yeah. in D.C. we'll probably be doing a meetup as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so really, they're just all excuses to drink, really. That's, <laughs> that's what we're looking for. And it's fun oh, to meet all our We're going to be at listening. the bar anyway, Leo. Right. <laughs> exactly. I'm just saying, right. if you're there. Might as well have a meetup. If you're there. Yeah. yeah. Come yeah. on by. Come on mm -hmm. down. All right, let's take a break. We uh, have a tip, topic, uh, software pick, beer pick, lots of stuff still to come. The, I call it the back of the book. Part of the magazine I always liked the best, right there with the weird ads it's for X-ray specs. Column. The That's Dvorak column, the weird ad for <laughs> X-ray specs, and uh, our beer Rice, pick of the week. Nice coming up. sea monkeys. <laughs> sea monkeys, coming up. <laughs> our show today brought to you by Citrix. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Makers of share files. Uh -huh. mm. And I think, frankly, this is exactly what people are looking for when they're looking for a way to uh, share files. Instead of adding an email attachment to your business email, and I think a lot of people are doing that, and we recommend against it for a lot of reasons. It's how viruses get spread. It's not secure. And, of course, you know, there's the pure practical aspect of it. Bounce backs. You can't attach a big old presentation or a spreadsheet a contract to a to an email and and ho and know it's going to get there. You lose control of the thing. If you're if you're sending important or confidential documents as email attachments, you really ought to check out ShareFile from Citrix. Instead of sending a, an attachment, 
Share file sends a secure link. In fact, let me log into my um, share file, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, I can actually give you a little uh, demo of ShareFile because I use it. I do. I use it every single week um, to share files with radio stations. In fact, right after the show, that's what I'll be doing. Note one thing right away: it is branded. It, is, it looks doesn't not the ShareFile branding. It's your company corporate logo. It looks like your file. You can uh, send a file. You can request a file. Um, so let's say uh, I want to look at one of my folders. Now these folders are populated automatically. ShareFile synchronizes with your desktop. So it's automatic. In fact, if you're using the Outlook plugin, ShareFile even makes it uh, easy to uh, send these, and it looks to you like you're sending an email attachment. These are all files I'm going to send out to different radio stations. You can see, by the way, you can also give users permissions. It, they can even be notified when there is an upload to a folder. So they can just say, I don't have to send them an email even. They just say, oh, my new stuff is here. But let's say I want to send uh, something along to WHLO in beautiful downtown wherever. Uh, I'm going to click the send button, and uh, I can do it as an email. You can use the share file interface to create an email, but I like to do the links. And there are some parameters you can set on the links. Email me when the item has been downloaded. Require recipients to enter name before downloading an email. I could say how long the uh, access is when it expires, how many times it can download it. And then I'm going to get this secure link. Now, let me copy that to the clipboard and paste it in, so I'll show you what they're going to see. And this is why ShareFile is so great. They don't have to log in. They don't have to create an account. They get my logo and a very simple button, a green button, as a matter of fact, that they press that says download, and that's it. They know what they're getting, how big it's going to be. It couldn't be easier. If it's multiple files, it's automatically zipped for you. ShareFile is fantastic. That's why I want you to try it today. Visit ShareFile. Dot com and we've got a 30-day free trial waiting for you. Do me a favor, though, to get that free trial, there's a number of places you can click on the page, but do the one at the top that says Podcast Listeners. Click here. And when you are asked for the offer code, use Windows as the offer code so they'll know you heard it on Windows Weekly. Do pick your industry, too, because ShareFile can be customized for a variety of industries. HIPAA compliant, compliant with regulations in the financial services industry and lots of other places. It's the way to go. If you're sending files, don't attach them to email. Share them instead with sharefile.com. We thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. Time for Paul and his tip of the week. <clears throat> My tip is about how you can add yellow pages and lining to OneNote notes. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <I'm very> <laughs> <laughs> oh, hallelujah. A little, a little spiral tab at the top of the surface and we're set. Yeah. No. Um, Microsoft has a new, it's, a, it's weird, it's an add-in for um, PowerPoint, but uh, it's available in a preview form, but you have to sign up for it. And um, that's the reason it's a tip and not a pick, because not everyone can get it right away. But what this is, is an add-in for PowerPoint called Office Mix that adds, well, two things, uh, audio and video recording capabilities. And so you can create a, a video version of your oh, presentation that will neat. play straight through, which is very cool. Yeah. But also interactivity uh, bits like uh, quizzes and applications. Uh, applications that can add things like, uh, you know, uh, basically anything you can add, you know, to uh, to Office these days. It's, it's, it's actually kind of impressive, although there aren't many apps yet. I mean, the capabilities are impressive. So... At the most basic level, you can record a, a version of your presentation that has audio and or video, uh, audio and video or audio, I should say. Uh, and you can put that out as a, as a recording, like a, uh, an MP4 file. So that's, that's pretty neat. You can add uh, quizzes. Um, they have like polls, uh, true, false, you know, multiple choice, that kind of thing. Uh, videos, there's content from um, Khan that Microsoft provides. You can add in. Um, there's not much on the app side yet, but I, I played around with enough just to kind of see how the quizzes worked. And it's kind of just a neat little interactive bit. Um, if you are familiar with uh, PowerPoint, you know that I think it was Office 2010, they added a uh, the ability to publish presentations to the web. And of course, since then, they've come out with Office Web Apps, now Office Online. And so what this tool does is it allows you to save these things up to Office Online now. And people can hit it over the internet and interact with it. And so you could use it for like a class lesson, like an interactive class lesson where you provide, you know, audio and or video while presenting. And then you have a little bit of a quiz at the end of a section or at the end of the whole thing. And um, it's it's kind of like the full meal deal. And so it kind of um, takes PowerPoint and takes it, you know, to the next level. Um, I suspect that what we're seeing here in, in Office Mix is 
something that will just be power, part of PowerPoint uh, going forward. But for now, it's uh, a plug-in only for the 2013 version. So if you go to, I think it's mix.office.com. Let me just check on that. I think that is it. Uh, well, I don't see it, but I believe, yeah, here we go. Yeah, mix.office.com. Uh, you can sign up and then you, you'll be led into it eventually. I signed up, you know, when they first announced it and um, got access to it, I think, yesterday. So I've only just kind of hit the surface of it. but um, And it's early yet, too. So I think a lot of the apps and quizzes and things will uh, improve over time. But it's, it's just a cool little add-in. I mean, anyone who's wanted to do a little bit more with uh, PowerPoint will appreciate that. And it doesn't cost anything. Right. It's just a free add-in. Nice. Yeah. Again, yeah, I think I, it's just going to be... I wonder oh, if it's going to be an add-in or an actual new app like a separate app oh really yeah okay yeah i don't know i'm just speculating. Oh, the, yeah i don't know either actually okay so yeah that could be the thing is you know i, I look at this and I, it it melds very naturally into powerpoint and it wouldn't be hard to imagine it being integrated a little further you know so if you're familiar with powerpoint you know you can do like an f5 and it does a present um I, it wouldn't be hard to integrate that into this kind of thing because you can preview it now, uh, which is separate from the F5 stuff. But it seems like it could just be part of it too, you know. And so I guess we'll see how they yeah. do it eventually. I'm not really sure. It's very natural. I, I mean, I I think when because you knew oh, Mary Jo was I'm sure was the first to report on this. It was probably a a beta app of its own at one point, right? Like a standalone thing. Yeah, they, they actually demoed it last year at the Microsoft company meeting, um, and okay. it was codenamed Remix at that point. Yeah. And it, they kind of played it up as digital storytelling. Like, that was kind of the buzzword they used when they talked about it. Yeah, I mean, it looks to me more like it's like a like uh, for teachers, you know, for a lesson kind of a thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, but I, it, could, I, it know, could have broader implications at some point, right? Like right now, education. Yeah, past sure. point. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's just interesting because they added it to PowerPoint as an add-in. And when you see how it works, it's like, wow, it, this seems like something that should have been here all along. Like, this makes so much sense. It, it works really well. Cool. So, yeah, hopefully it will come together quickly. Um, the software pick is something called Start Perfect. Um, I was tipped off to this this morning by somebody named Steve Pelton. It's not free, but it's only 99 cents. And it's kind of the U Uber utility, if you will, for those people who have gotten Windows Phone 8.1 and they're really interested in those transparent tile effects, but want them to be applied to more things. And um, it does a, a bunch of other stuff. Like I had, uh, I, I think I used this as a tip previously. Uh, it's from the same guys that make transparency tiles. And transparency tiles, I think is free, but what it does is, it might be 99 cents too, but it's either free or 99 cents. But what that app does is it, it basically gives you a list of apps. It's not every app on your phone, but a lot of apps. And you check off the ones you want, and it changes their tiles to be transparent. And so that gives you that better effect with, you know, a background image. And so what Start Perfect does is it does that, but it does it for more apps. And then it provides other functionality as well. You can arbitrarily pin websites uh, to your start screen that have um, either a transparent background with a star or a custom background of your choosing. It's, it doesn't actually take graphics from the website, unfortunately, but... It lets you at least do that. It lets you pin a bunch of stuff from settings, which is a feature I've never understood wasn't part of Windows Phone. It's not everything in settings, but it's some stuff you can't pin right now, like email and accounts, lock screen, uh, location, notifications and actions and so forth. A bunch of stuff that is part of settings. That's really cool. Um, and it also gives you, and I don't, I'm not going to use this one personally, but it gives you the ability to pin transparent tiles to the start screen. And what that lets you do is space things out a little bit. You know, the way that Windows Phone works now is you can have empty spaces, but you can't have empty spaces between rows. And so this gives you the ability to essentially create empty rows between actual tiles that don't really do anything or have cool little, you know, flipping transparent effects if you want that. Um, and so you can kind of customize that start screen you know, more than you could normally. And so between all of these things, and there's a couple of other things, you can create labels and, you know, <laughs> fills and tints, and there's all kinds of excellent capabilities. Um, it's 99 cents. I mean, it's, an, it's, it's a cool little app if you really want your Windows Phone 8.1 start screen to look as good as it can. I'm going to play with this. That's yeah, cool. it's a good one. Yeah. Start perfect, 99 cents. 
Now, Mary Jo Foley has some stuff for us. <laughs> yes. So for Enterprise Pick of the Week, I'm going to have a whole bunch of acronym soup here. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, the pick is called MDOP 2014. And MDOP is the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Pack. So this is a collection of tools, virtualization tools, management tools, and security tools that people who are volume customers who have software assurance uh, can buy. They, you pay an extra fee for this bundle of tools. And the new release that just came out on May 1st and is downloadable from the Volume Licensing Center, the VLSC, includes MBAM, Microsoft BitLocker Administration and Monitoring 2.5, as well as Microsoft Application Virtualization 5.0 Service Pack 2, also known as uh, App V. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go Ooh. ahead. You're not, not, not Mavsp2. I know, I know. Mavsp2. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's more acronyms in this thing, too. There's DART, the Diagnostics and Recovery Tool Set. There's UEV, the User Experience Virtualization Tool. But just trust me, there are a whole bunch of tools that people find very helpful in managing their Windows systems. Uh, so if you are a volume licensee and you have software assurance and you don't mind paying this uh, supplemental fee, you may find MDOP very useful to you. And the 2014 has some new uh, compliance uh, capabilities around FIPS 140-2, uh, as well as some new uh, pub application publishing advances that are part of the app V capabilities so yeah it's a lot it's a lot a mouthful of things but very useful to many enterprise users i know <laughs> cool and you mentioned that uh, you, your code name pick of the week comes from tech ed it does um so this has been my code name pick of the week before but it's very uh apt since it's just around the corner that we're going to learn about this the code name is called helios project helios mm, i like that and uh next week at tech ed Scott Hanselman and Scott Hunter, who are both very known in the Microsoft development community, they refer to themselves jokingly as the lesser Scots because they are not Scott Guthrie. <laughs> they are going to be <laughs> unveiling. Yeah. That's cute. Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah. They are going to be unveiling what's called Project Helios. And from the TechEd um, content slides that I've looked at uh, that are available, not the slides, the um, little abstracts that they have on the different sessions, they describe Project Helios this way. It's, it's about the future of .NET on the server. In other words, ASP.NET. And this is going to help people write ASP.NET applications using something called OWIN, which is an authentication protocol for my limited understanding. Oh, and it also win. is going to let you plug... Owen, Oh, right? win. Oh, win. Oh, win. <laughs> oh, win. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that Scott Hanselman and Hunter are going to talk about this and explain to people who uh, are developing ASP.NET apps kind of where Microsoft's going and what they're thinking. And they're going to be talking about this Project Helios thing, which for, I think is the way that you're going to write apps going forward. But we'll, we'll find out next Tuesday when they do their session. Interesting. Interesting. And we couldn't really do this show without a lot of beer. <laughs> That's right. That's why we're. By the way, I, yes. I just want to say I love your description of this beer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my beer pick of the week is a sour, and it's uh, Leo. Leo can correct my pronunciation because it's a French name. Abbe de, de Saint Bon Chien. Bon Chien means good dog. Good Save dog. Good, good dog. dog. Yes. But, but and it's how did you describe it in the notes? <laughs> Yes, so it's it's from a, 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 a brewery called the Brasserie de Franche Montagne, which is in Switzerland. And I called it a gateway sour. And the reason I called <laughs> so it this... Awesome. I want it. Uh, so and awesome. People have been asking me a lot, like, if you're, if you're not a regular sour drinker, what should you drink as your first sour to try to get into the style? Because it's it's a very um, unfamiliar style to people who don't know that. Is it uh, actually It smells sour? like vinegar. It is. Yeah, it's it's vinegarish, yep. and yeah. uh, the reason it is is it's aged in Merlot whiskey and uh, grappa ooh, barrels. Ooh, <laughs> I guess all three. Yeah, and yeah. so it does have a very sour taste to it, but in a good way. Like it's a sour that you'll you'll your first sip you may go eh, sour, and then the more sips you have, the more you're gonna like it. That's my prediction. <laughs> I like vinegar, so I imagine I would like this. It's kind <laughs> of like a hybrid wine beer thing 
going on. Uh, and it's very it's very refreshing. It's it's almost like if you know what a Flemish red style of beer is, it's sim- kind of similar to that. So yeah, I call it my gateway sour. If you if you if awesome. you can find this anywhere on tap in bottles, it's from Switzerland. So our Where European could you find this on can- tap? I did. I had it on tap. Really? Oh, you you yeah. live in a wonderland. How is this yes. possible? Yes, <laughs> rattling humderland. That is. <laughs> yeah, wow. I had this on tap um, recently, and it was fantastic. That's incredible. So on tap. European listeners, if you can find this, the Abbe de Saint Bonchien from BFM. And European listeners, if you can find this, I hate you. Just to be clear. <laughs> you like sours, Paul? Oh yeah. It's not hoppy. It's just sour. I understand. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it sucks the hops right out of the beer. It's good. It's the antithesis <laughs> of hoppy. It is. Actually, so Mary Jo gave me some uh beer that was is an IPA. That is not oh, yeah, hoppy, it, not overly high. And I like that quite a bit. What was it called? I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> she gave you some beer. She plied it, you. With <laughs> <laughs> no, it was actually, uh, this was pretty cool. It was from one of our listeners who is from Canada, and he brought it from Waterloo for yes. us. Oh, yes. oh. Right. And uh, Waterloo. it was from Waterloo Brewing. It, it's just called their basic IPA, and it's a yeah. very English style, so not hoppy. It's excellent. Yeah, that's very good. Good. Glad you like that one. Yeah. I just have to drink more beer. That's all. Every time I listen to this show, <laughs> I think I should be drinking more beer. That's Over time, my nose is going to get redder and redder. <laughs> <laughs> Both of us. <laughs> Paul Therat, the, the he of the soon-to-be red nose, is at the super site for Windows, windsupersite.com. He's an analyst for Penton Media, writes for Windows IT Pro. And uh, his most recent book, which one do you want me to plug? You do so many. Uh, I guess oh. the Windows. Windows 8.1. Field guide, and that is in bookstores yet. Not yet. That's going to happen soon. soon. It's been taking a long time to get that but into you, Amazon. But you can go Sorry. To windows eight one book dot com, and you can see yes. it and yes. buy it. Yes. It's right there. Uh, Mary Jo Foley writes about Microsoft at allaboutmicrosoft.com, drinks her beer at Rattle and Hum in beautiful Manhattan. <laughs> they will both be in Houston, <coughs> and perhaps next Tuesday at the Houston Saucer. What time? Yep, Flying Saucer, probably. Six, six five, in six, the evening, five there. or six. Go in there, get a seat, and enjoy the fun. <laughs> a bar fight is sure to break out. <laughs> we do. We'll be fighting over MDOP. MDOP. And they'll be uh, <laughs> then. They, then the next day, you guys are going to a Microsoft event, or no? When is the uh, one in Manhattan? 20th. Oh, that's two weeks. Okay, good. I yep. was going to say yep. you you got a busy schedule. Uh, yeah. But we'll be back here next Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern yep. Time, 1800 UTC. That's when you can watch live as we do Windows Weekly. But if you can't make it live, on-demand audio and video available always after the fact at twit, twit.tv slash WW. Or get it from your favorite podcatcher, you know, Stitcher, if you listen to Stitcher. Um, there's some. There's actually a wonderful Windows Phone app by Dimitri Lialin. The Twit app is really beautiful, very nicely done. You can listen there. You can listen live with that as well. Uh, we have apps on all the major platforms, including Roku. Um, so get the app. That's a good way to listen on a regular basis. And uh, we'll see you next week on Windows Weekly. Mm-hmm.